guys, this is Nurse J at Nursing the Truth, and today's topic is going to be a little disturbing for some. If you are still in the Christian church, this might bother you a little bit, but I want you to stay with me to where I can present the evidence to you and let you decipher and think about this stuff on your own time. I'm going to go strictly into the scriptures in your Bible, and I'm reading out of the King James Version. And, you know, for many years in the church and in Sunday school, and with me being a teacher with my husband uh, for years in the Sunday school um, classes, I have never read these things until I started going on my spiritual journey about what is religion, who gave it to us, why do they give it to us, and what's the purpose of it. And if you use common sense and you take off the religious eyes, then you can look for yourself and start deciphering things. And this is the age of Aquarius, the truth, not the age of, you know, just believing. You always have to search for the truth. And so with Thoth here, the God of wisdom and knowledge, and his wife is Ma'at, which is the lady of justice and righteousness and truth, the one that holds your Libra scales, and that is in the Department of Justice. You see, everything that the Americas have was brought here by Rome. You see, Rome conquered Greece, and Greece conquered Egypt. So everything comes from Egypt. And therefore, in some form or fashion, we have Egyptian laws. So when you start looking into the Bible, everything points back to Egypt. Because you see, the people that gave us this Bible, they had no really civilization and they had no actual heritage, so they had to go steal it from someone else that had so much to give mankind. So with that said, today's title is going to be The Church Has Lied to You because Jesus did not die, he did not ascend, and Jesus is not coming back. So just hold on, get your Bibles, and we will go through the scriptures one by one, and I'll explain to you how we've been deceived. Okay, so let's go to Mark 1331. Now, Mark is the oldest gospel in the New Testament. And the oldest New Testament completion was in the Codex Sinaiticus. That is the oldest completed version of the New Testament was a Codex Sinaiticus. 
And Mark is the oldest gospel that was in the Codex Sinaiticus. Now if we go to Mark 13, 31, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels who are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Okay, let's go to Revelations or Revelation 1 7. Now, Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also who pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Well, that's kind of like a contradiction right there because it says that no man, no angels, not even the sun, is going to know the day that God cometh. So Jesus is talking about the Father coming. But see in Revelation, it's telling you, or the church is making you believe it's Jesus is coming. Okay. So right there, that's a contradiction because if Jesus doesn't even know when the Father's coming, but the church is telling us that Jesus is coming in 1-7. Now let's go to Luke 17 and 20. Okay. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. So, in Luke, he's telling you that you're not going to see any kingdom come, um, that the kingdom of God is inside of you okay but if you go to like I said again mark 13 31 he's telling you that heaven and earth shall pass away but my words will not but of that day and that hour knoweth no man not even the angels which are in heaven neither the son but the father Take heed and watch and pray that you know when the time ends. So this is a blatant contradiction So Mark is telling you that no man knows, not even the angels, not even the son, but the father only. But then in Luke, he tells you there's not going to be a son. Because the kingdom of God is within you. Now let's go to Mark 24 and 6. I mean, excuse me, Matthew 24 and 6. If I said Mark, I'm sorry. Matthew 24 and 6. Now, 
Now, in this passage, we have to understand that this Jesus character was talking to his disciples. In this text, Jesus is always talking to his disciples and no one else. He's not talking to the year of 2018. He wasn't talking to the year of 1800. He was talking to the first century. And talking to his disciples, he said, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not come. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet of Daniel, standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Well, let me give you a little history on this. During the first century, there was a prophecy that was spoken of in the book of Daniel that was also made up by the Jews when they made their Bible. Um, and that's another video. Um, but anyway, they had made um, a timetable for whenever this prophecy was, prophecy was supposed to be taking place. Well, during this prophetic time, they were looking for a Messiah to get Rome out of Jerusalem. And it just so happened that it was during the first century. And this was not a little peaceful, little love and peace and, you know, get along time. Rome hated the Jews and slaughtered them by the thousands, 500 to 2,000 at a time, were on crucifixes coming into Jerusalem. There was bloodshed every day. So there couldn't have been a little skipping along Messiah, turn the other cheek, you know, don't do this, don't do that. These were um, revolutionists. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls even talks about, um, you know, these revolutionists that wanted to take over and get run out. Now, not to say that there were some people that were living by the Torah um, or the Tanakh that, um, you know, wanted to do good because internally um, we are good and we want to do good, but people can corrupt you if you want to do and follow their ways. Now, to have someone take thousands and thousands of people and put them on the Mount of Olives and feed them with fish and bread of four to 5,000, you know, Rome wasn't going to handle that too well because they already knew that the Jews didn't like them. The Jews didn't even want to have anything to do with any other people but their own. They hated the Gentiles. We're called Goyim to them. So right there, there's not going to be peace and harmony. 
he's talking about the first century um, of the temple destruction. See, this Mark was written after the temple of Jerusalem was crushed down by the Roman soldiers, Titus and Vespasian. You see, this person that wrote this already knew that the rumors of wars were going to come starting on because of this messianic revolution. There was famine and pestilence, and there was an earthquake as well in the first century. Um, they hated, they had zealots, they had um, false prophets running around um, that were deceiving people. You had the Egyptian um, prophet, you had Yeshua ben Ananus um, that was running around going, whoa, whoa, to Jerusalem. Um, you know, you had people that were um, running around saying that the temple was going to come down, um, you know. So, and the abomination of desolation was the Roman emperors. Because, see, any time that people of the other nations would come up on the temple, they would call them abominations because, see, it was strictly for the Jews. So, that's what that is talking about. So, but what's funny is that um, this Jesus um, was telling you there again that when all these things are preached in the world and as a witness, then shall the end come. But he just told you in Luke 17, 20, that the kingdom is not coming with observation. That the kingdom of God is within you. And then Revelation 1, 7 you know, it talks about um, that every eye shall see and that he's coming in the cloud. See, there's too many contradictions. This is a lying Bible you have. So let's go to Mark 1 and 14. See, I'm giving you these verses so you can look this up. Mark 1 and 14 and 15 says, Now after that, John was put in prison. I'm talking about John the Baptist. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Another contradiction. You see, you have to know the history of the first century of the Jews and the Roman Wars to understand what is going on. This is nothing but the messianic revolution that these Jews were looking for in the first century between 1 and 100. That's the first century. So anytime between that, they're looking for that. Now, in Josephus's complete works of the Jews, he talks about John the Baptist. Now, whether that was his true words or if that was written in later by the Christian church by Eusebius of Caesarea, we don't know. But in the book, he writes about this John the Baptist and that Herod was afraid of him because he had a group of followers and they were a lot. He had a great multitude and he was afraid that this John was going to overrun him and take over Judea. And then that's when, quote unquote, John was put in prison and his head was cut off. You see, 
So anytime a Roman soldier cuts your head off, that is something really bad. You have really upset the Roman government because to get your head cut off, you must have done something really bad. And then it says in 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Well, there again, the kingdom of God is at hand. What he is talking about, what this Jesus is talking about, or whoever was this Jesus, was talking about the kingdom of the messianic revolution, the prophecy that was prophesied in Daniel. And this is what he's saying. Because in the scriptures, Jesus is saying, do not go to anyone but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's not saying go to the Gentiles because this prophecy is especially for the Israel people because he is trying to get as many people as he can for this revolution to come up and fight with the Romans. So he is telling everybody, get ready. The kingdom is at hand. This has been prophesied in Daniel. And this messianic revolution is coming here to kick ass and take names later. It's not meant for this time now. This was in the time of the first century. So you cannot read this Bible and think that this Jesus is coming back. He's talking to you right now through these scriptures when he was talking to them at that time. Excuse me. Let's go to Mark 9.1. And not only am I trying to give you scriptures and tell you what they mean, I'm trying to give you a historical background. Because I've read a lot of Josephus' works and the Roman and Jews and Tacitus and uh, Suetonius and Pliny the Younger um, and all these players, you have to understand you've got to get your historical facts and then when you read the Bible, then you can understand it. 9-1 says, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So let that sink in with him for just a minute. Verily I say unto you, it's talking to the disciples, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. See, we've been taught that this Jesus was going to come back down in the clouds, great glory and great power. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is a king of kings and lords of lords. And he's going to have this sash on his thigh and he's going to be on a horse. And you're going to see all these angels come down with a two-edged sword and he's going to slice and dice, right? That is what we have been taught. But if you know the first century history, okay, he's saying that some of them shall stand there and not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Some of these, when this revolution is going to take place, some of them are going to die and some of them are going to live. Because this, king, this kingdom that the star prophecy of the first century was talking about is the kingdom of God. That actually God was going to have send a person as a king to rule Israel. And that he was going to have a 
priesthood from the line of Aaron to rule the priests. But in this passage, it talks about, um, from what we've been taught, is that this kingdom is coming. Well, look, he's already said that the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that's a hermetic principle of the great Hermes Trimogestus Thoth here. If you read the Hermetica, which we'll get into that another day and another time, the Egyptian mystery schools. Um, but this kingdom is supposed to be an actual kingdom to be ushered in through the Messianic revolt. So let's go to Matthew 10 and 5 and 7. Matthew 10 and 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and to any city of the Samarians enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Behold, this is in 16, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. See, the wolves were the Roman guards and the soldiers. And this Jesus was sending his disciples, these revolutionaries, into the crowds wise as serpents and harmless as doves. See, in ancient Egyptian, the serpents or snakes represented wisdom. And we already knew this. See how the writers are putting all this in here. Matthew 10 and 23. But when they persecute you in this city, talking about the disciples again, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be come. So, I can just see these 12 disciples being persecuted in this one city and he's, they're fleeing into another, and um, they're not going to come back to Israel until this Jesus comes back, their leader, their messianic leader, whoever this guy is. Second Timothy three and sixteen. <laughs> okay, so if you think that your Bible is the inerrant words of the creator God that made the universe and atoms. You're mistaken. This thing has been edited, interpolated, stripped, 
several versions, lies mixed in with a little truth. And so when we go to 2 Timothy 3 and 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Okay, so basically the Roman Catholic Church is telling you that this is just a um, disclosure. You know how like you read on some cereal boxes or cigarette things, you know, that says, oh, this could cause cancer you know, pregnant women shouldn't smoke cigarettes, low birth weight. This is a disclosure for the Bible. Kind of telling you. Profitable for doctrine. Sounds like a money game changer to me. It's profitable for doctrine. For reproof. Well, re is like going over before so reproofing reread reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness John 19.38 and you're not going to get this type of teaching in, in church because they're taught to stay away from certain verses John 19 and 38 and 39. Okay, this is where it's going to look a little tricky here. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. You see, if they had put verse 39 where 38 is, it would make a whole lot of sense. But see, the way they put the verses, you're not thinking. Look at 39 again, guys, and let's pretend that it was before, you know, 38. Let's just read, let's just do the verses backwards and see if you catch what I've learned. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. Nicodemus was first to go to the tomb of Jesus and gave Jesus a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. What the hell? 
Are you going to do with the 100 pounds of aloe vera? Well, let me tell you something. I'm a nurse and I know my herbs. And aloe vera is a healing property. It also helps with bruising and it also stops bleeding. Okay, so let's do a little definition of myrrh. Okay. And see what kind of properties myrrh has. Okay. Well, interesting. Myrrh is a natural gum or resin extracted from a number of small thorny tree species. Myrrh resin has been used throughout history as perfume, incense, and medicine. He just said that a mixture of myrrh, well, guess what? Myrrh mixed with wine can also be ingested. So you could put a little of this and mix it up in some wine and give it to somebody as medicine. Okay. In pharmacy, myrrh is used as an antiseptic in mouthwashes, gargles, and toothpaste. Myrrh is currently used in some liniments and healing salves that may be applied to abrasions and other minor skin ailments. Myrrh has also been recommended as an analgesic for toothaches and can be used in liniment for bruises, aches, and sprains. So, an antiseptic helps with bruises, scrapes, cuts. Oh, it gets better. Let's go to John 20 and 11 through 18. And I hope by what I'm showing you today, will make you reconsider you being in this church. And I hope that you come out of this delusion that you will quit giving your money to the Roman Catholic Church. So John 20 and 11 states, let's put the pieces together. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why thou sweepest? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. All right. First of all, if you've been with this Jesus cat for three years, you're going to know who the hell Jesus is. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She's supposing him to be the gardener. Saith unto him, Sir, if they have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said, Rabboni, which is to say master. Jesus saith unto her, touch me not. I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. 
So let's capture this right quick. So if Nicodemus goes first to Jesus and gives him a mixture of myrrh, which is an antiseptic and help with uh, for medicinal purposes, and also give aloe to stop the bleeding um, and also to help with um, the wounds. And then Joseph of Arimathea comes and strips Jesus out of the tomb from Pilate. And then the next day when Mary goes to see um, the Lord, um, this body is not there because he's dressed up as a damn gardener. Because, see, people are going to be looking for him. Because they're going to be telling people, oh, he's not there, he's not there. So, he's dressed up as a damn gardener. You can't look like a gardener if you're not dressed as one. So, this cat jumped up, survived the crucifixion, dressed up as a gardener. Mary goes to the guys and says, hey, guess what? I saw Jesus, he's alive, and blah, blah, blah. Now, if you go to Mark 16, it ends at verse 8. Okay, Mark um, 16, uh, verse 9 through 20, uh, was never in the original Codex Sinaiticus. Okay. It ends with eight. And you see, verse eight says, And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed, neither said anything to any man, for they, excuse me, for they were afraid. And you see, 9 through 20 talks about that, um, when, uh, Jesus was risen the first day of week. He, had par he, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, whom, out, whom he had cast seven devils. And, and that he said that if you go preach the world, baptize in my name, you shall, um, you know, uh, lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. And then, you know, um, speak in new tongues. And that if you drink poison, uh, you will die. That's a bunch of hogwash. Okay, let's go to Luke 24 and 37. And this is where it's a trip. 24 and 37. <laughs> this is funny. Okay, so we're going to go to Luke 24, 37 through 40 and 41. So... And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be upon you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, it's my hands, my feet. This is my Handle me. See me. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. I have flesh. I have bones. It's me. Touch my hands. Touch my feet. And when he thus spoke and he showed them his hands and feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, and he wondered, and he saith unto them, Have you not have any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb, and he took it, and he did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You see, this was an orchestrated event. 
Because in the story, Pilate, um, he said he was innocent. But who knows? Behind the backdrop, Pilate could have had a deal done with someone. But he also couldn't believe that Jesus was dead in three hours. He kept questioning, like, what? There's no way he could be dead. All right, so basically this cat that was doing this messianic movement, you know, in the even in the very first um, prophecies, the Messiah is not supposed to die. But this cat, I don't know where the hell he got that from because that's not in the uh, prophecies in your Old Testament that this Messiah is supposed to die. So I don't know uh, why the hell it says that uh, it is written and thus it's behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. They did a lot of um, Egyptian mystery schools to where to become a god or the son of God, they would put you in these um, sepulchers, or these tombs, and put like a ton of rock on it. And you had to stay in these things for three days. And if they lifted the lid up and you um, came out of the tomb, you resurrected, you rose like Osiris from the dead, you resurrected after the third day, then you were a god. You were the son of God as well. So basically, this is just one of those Egyptian mystery school things that they have in their writings. But this cat was clearly flesh and blood. Let me read that to you again. Why are you troubled? You act like you've seen a spirit, a ghost. Behold, this is my hands, my feet. This is myself. It's me. Handle me. See me. For spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. I'm hungry, homeboy. Give me uh, some bread. I mean, some fish and some honeycombs. Let me eat that shit up. Because I'm fixing to truck my ass on somewhere else. Matthew 12 and 38. I'm almost finished, guys. A couple more scriptures. I hope this has opened your eyes some. Twelve and thirty-eight says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Well, a little bit back little bit of a backdrop on Jonas as he was supposedly caught in this big-ass whale's mouth for three days, which, that's a bunch of shit. If you're going to believe that a man is going to be in a damn whale's body, first of all, if you go in a whale's mouth, he's going to bite your ass and, and put you in the stomach and your damn uh, acid juices and everything else, you're going to suffocate and shit in there. So that ain't going to happen. But supposedly, this Jonas survived this whale and got spit out through the blowhole after three days and he was alive. So basically what this Jesus was saying is that um, there's not going to be no sign given to you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Well, Jonas didn't die. He, he, he rose in three days. Well, this Jesus cat supposedly rose after three days. He's not going to die. Hebrews 5 and 5. So Christ, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he saith also 
and another place. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And see, this Melchizedek in the Old Testament was supposed to have been a high priest and that he took, um, or that Abraham had given him 10% of um, his money. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers, now listen to this, very key. Who in the days of his flesh, talking about this Jesus guy, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So if you catch this number, Hebrews 5 and 7, it says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers, I'm talking about when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, was strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. So he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's getting pissed off because everybody was sleeping and he was praying and praying and praying and praying because he knew that this messianic thing with Rome, it was it, it was coming down. He had done, you know, caused a lot of havoc. He was running through. He was money changing the tables, you know, causing scene at the temple. You know, you had these um, people that were with him and, um, you know, just trying to fight against him. Well, then he goes up to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and that they came with the whole legion of, of army people, Roman people. I think it was about um, maybe 600 or so of Roman. Now, why in the hell are you going to go up to a mountain or the garden with 600 Roman soldiers just to get you and a few disciples, you see? And Peter had a sword, and he cut off one of the Roman soldiers' ears, okay, according to the story. So they were already slicing and dicing because Jesus in one of the scriptures said, sell your uh, cloak and go get you a damn knife. Now, what the hell? I thought Jesus was preaching peace, love, turn the other cheek, you know, all this. But no, he wasn't. He was going on a messianic movement. Skirting through towns, going to this town, going to that town. Only go to the the Israel lights because we're fixing to kick ass and take names later against these Romans. Put this away. Go get you a, a, a damn knife. And one of the scriptures it talks about that Jesus says, If no one worships me, then bring them here in front of me and kill them. Oh, yeah. You didn't know about that, did you? Is your preacher going to talk about that? See? That's why this is bullshit. You need to get the hell out of it. Quit having your children brainwashed. God delusioned. Because it all stems from Judaism. Judaism is, a, is, is bullshit. Christianity is bullshit. Islam is bullshit. All of it's bullshit. Now, when they want to make Jesus look nice, those are actually from the Hindu and Buddhist traditions. Krishna. Because, see, all that was before Christianity. Okay. So you have a lot of Greek mythology, um, Egyptian, Hermeticist, um, Hermetic principles, Hindu, Krishna, um, so they had to go get all of this and put it into this character, even though it could have been a real man during a messianic movement like uh, Jesus ben Pandera or Jesus ben Panaka, uh, which you can look this stuff up for yourself. Um, there's also a story of this uh, Jesus ben um, Pandera um, in the Toldoth Yeshu, um, T-O-L-E. D-O-T-H, uh, Y-E-S-H-U, 
um, which this person was in the first century BCE under the King Janius um, and the Queen Salome Alexandra, where it talks about this guy was in Egypt, he came out, um, he did this, he did that, you know, um, he was buried, um, he was removed, um, uh, the disciples were saying he resurrected, but they found him, um, so, something about a gardener, they found him, um, he was, uh, then they drug him in, in the front of the people on the road, um, it's just a lot. So go look that up. So Jesus did not die. He did not resurrect. He did not ascend to heaven. And he is not at the right hand side of the Father. I'm sorry to have been bringing the, you this information. The pastors are up there lying through their teeth. They have been deceived through their seminaries and their Bible colleges, through the Roman Catholic Church. You can comment. Um, you can leave whatever comments you want. That's fine. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you. And I'm, help, I'm here to set you free. I'm free. And I'm done. So as again, me and Thoth say, when you search for the truth and you find the truth, let the truth set you free. And there again, me and Thoth say, Hotep and Ashe.